Hello and welcome back on Prime Time and welcome to episode 2 of this uh, January issue mainly dedicated to the SIHH and to all the newsworthy stuff not covered by our various individual reports and there is plenty. If you haven't seen episode 1, well link is in the description box. So in terms of trans witness at uh, the SIHH 2018, and this is mainly relevant for the big power names of the industry belonging to the Richmond Group, well many of these brands came with more affordable watches, more entry level models, and I'm not saying that they are cheap by any means, okay, but let's say a bit more in line with some kind of economical reality asked by the customers. We're still talking serious money regardless, because uh, a few thousand dollars for an object we don't really need is always a considerable amount of money. So when uh, Vacheron Constantin presents their new, uh, presented their new 56 collection starting around $12,000, it's still a lot of money, but at the same time, it's definitely a big statement that the brand wants to reconnect to a new segment of the market, or let's say a segment that turns its interest probably on other brands or even other things or other leisures. Will this work for them? Sincerely, I don't know. I mean, and the same can be said for Gégère Lecoud with their new Polaris models or Panerai or Cartier. They all had pretty nice looking products at more affordable, more affordable prices, but I'm, a, I'm utterly convinced that a few years ago for exactly the same watches, all these brands would have positioned them much uh, higher in terms of prices. Well, it proves at least that these brands are listening to you, the consumers, uh, and instead of imposing two expensive models that no one really wanted, they have adapted their strategy, uh, strategy and I hope it will last uh, without compromising quality. There is naturally uh, still room for exceptional timepieces, and these actually face less difficulties finding new owners than the ones in this kind of no man's land for watches uh, that were simply just you know too highly priced in a context where the educated purchase prevails nowadays much more. And even if the economy is doing pretty good, and even uh, uh, if there is a bit of more spare cash uh, here and there, consumers are not spending anymore like in the mid uh, 2000s when the situation was a bit crazy and served, unfortunately, as the reference for normality for some of the watchmaking industry management. Well, we know that the rules of the games have changed and evolution is a natural process. And to be a little bit brutal, the name of the game is adapt or die, okay? Something we saw, for instance, in the car making industry when the reference for quality cars started to come from Japan, and this at a lower price point than what historical European and American brands had to offer in the 80s, 90s. So these last two had to adapt, some did and are striving, some didn't, are and are gone. And resizing can be part of the adaptation for the watchmaking in industry, but of course it conflicts uh, interests of shareholders when you're a publicly listed company. So this is of course uh, totally different for boutique brands, uh, mainly the independents, but they also have to adapt uh, to this new tougher environment. But let's come back uh, to watches and Gégère Le Coultre, which illustrates a bit uh, what I just mentioned. And you guys know that I'm still a bit annoyed with their ingratitude regarding our Giro Tourbillon video, which has, by the way, reached almost a whacking 1.4 million views. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But let's nevertheless talk about the, this new Polaris collection inspired by the 1968 Memovox Polaris Divers Alarm Watch. A watch dear to the collector's scene. So only uh, one of the new models has this alarm function. That's the, the model precisely celebrating the 50th anniversary of this watch and simply called the Polaris Memo Box and is limited to 1000 pieces. But then the brand came with a full range of other automatic watches in this Polaris collection, including a chrono, a world time chrono, a simple three hands and a date version, which uh, looks really decent, I think. And uh, the prices are more reasonable and start at $6,600. I'm pretty sure GG have pretty big expectation with this new uh, sportier assortment and time will tell but pretty nice in general. Let's now talk about Paneride and in the Lumino Due collection a few new models were introduced, a 45mm version for the first time with a, a date indicator, two 42mm uh, uh, models with uh, small seconds at 9 o'clock, a new 3-day GMT but most importantly they came with some 38mm models, something that was long awaited and the price of this model starts around $6,000. So historically the smallest Panerai were 40 millimeter, so this is really something new for them and should appeal to a pretty wide audience 
slash customer base. I mean, both men and women. But in their innovation line, they introduced another first for them with a moon phase indication on the Astronomo tribute to Galileo Galilei. This is a tourbillon regulator with equation of time indication plus a clever system for the indication of sunrise and sunset found uh, around the seven and four o'clock uh, mark. And regarding the moon phase, well, this is a no. I mean, this is no ordinary moon phase and is seen on the movement side of the watch. You actually have a 24-hour rotating disc that displays day and night indication. And additional to this, the moon will show you the phase in which it finds itself. Quite something. Yeah, real technical beast, I would say. So great achievement, uh, but personally, I'm not sure if it's necessary for them, uh, for such a brand to do those kind of things. Okay, I know some people will totally disagree with me, and I guess there are a few collectors out there willing or capable of purchasing this watch. No idea of the price tag, but we can guess it's uh, way, way, way up there. But anyhow, will this help them sell more of these 38 millimeter steel watches at 6K? Not really sure about this, but please feel free to share your opinion about this in commenting section is all yours. Okay, next brand, Roger Dubuis, uh, which on their side insisted uh, much more and almost exclusively about their new collaboration with the uh, Italian supercar manufacturer Lamborghini. They told us that, that there were some uh, strong interactions between both R&D teams and the first uh, iteration demonstrating uh, this uh, came with uh, the introduction of the 45mm Excalibur Aventador S with its distinct uh, double 45 degrees inclined balance wheels. But let's quickly listen to Grégory Butin, head of product product development uh, of the brand about this. Uh, the specificity of this movement is we have two balance wheels connected to the differential to the, to the, to the barrel. It's exactly the same construction than uh, ten car. Two wheels, one differential, one engine. And uh, for that, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good uh, link uh, with the partnership uh, with uh, Lamborghini. I just wanted to add that their partnership also includes the sponsoring of the various Lamborghini Endurance series of races and this spot was previously done in collaboration with Blancpain. And one of the problems I see with this is that when you type Blancpain on YouTube, the first tens of videos proposed to you concerns precisely these races and you never see the watches. So last year, a tire manufacturer partnership with Pirelli. How exciting was that? This year, a car manufacturer, so I just hope we won't see next year a partnership with a petrol company, Ajip, for instance. Okay, joke aside, and finally regarding Roger Dubuis, and as a very small moment of pause in this prime time, and since quite a, few, uh, quite a few of you were wondering who was this rather spectacular opera singer we used in our SHH video jingle, well, uh, she was there to mark the opening of the SHH for Roger Dubuis, because they always do some kind of booth uh, christening ceremony, as they are one of the only brands to change the decor of their booth every year. Actually, this year there were quite a few brands that had new booths. I guess they wanted to mark a before and after moment as we saw this with Piaget, Gégère Lecourt, and even a bit uh, Cartier and of course IWC. Okay, uh, let the music play, but not too long, I promise. Okay, after this little moment of culture, let's move on and talk about Van Cleef & Arpels, which presented incredibly beautifully jewelry timepieces in their Le Jardin collection, an amazing demonstration of their savoir-faire and above all their creativity. All one-offs and all very poetic and probably very pricey. But the highlight for me was their new planetarium timepiece, simply beautiful, and an evolution of the model introduced already a few years ago with the Midnight Planetarium. Both these timepieces done in collaboration with Dutch brand uh, Christian van der Klo and Daniel Reinches, the man specialist today in such astronomical uh, complication. So the main uh, noticeable difference between the, these two resides in the fact that this new timepiece is much smaller at 38 mm. The original one was 44 mm, something that makes complete sense since this watch uh, appeals more to a feminine market. So by making it smaller, this had an impact on its mechanics. You have a bit less space available and now you only have three planets orbiting in real time around the sun. The Earth being represented with this blue turquoise sphere. But the really, really cool part is that around the Earth you have a moon which orbits precisely like uh, moon cycles around it in 29.5 days and acts in a certain way as a moon phase indicator uh, depending on its position and the central sun. I mean, the intricacy of this mechanic is just fantastic without even mentioning how nice it looks with this aventurine dial. Okay, the price is uh, pretty hefty, starting at 245,000 US dollars, but uh, again, we're in dreamy territory. 
Okay, let's now talk about IWC who are celebrating their 150th anniversary this year and to mark the occasion they came with no less than 28 limited editions in practically all the collections, albeit the Aquatimer judged too sporty for this. Let's quickly listen to Christian Knopp, creative director of the brand, about this. We, we present two completely new movements here. One is a high-end movement, a perpetual calendar tourbillon. Uh, something very, very uh, unseen for IWC, combining our perpetual calendar with the tourbillon on the dial side. And we present a new generation of high end automatic movements, uh, the so called Caliber 82. We are presenting uh, on the Da Vinci automatic uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a very new edition in line with the aesthetics of the Jubilee collection. But the star of the show for them was the Paul Weber, paying tribute to a historically significant timepiece introduced in 1885 the first pocket watch that displayed time digitally with numerals and not with trailing hands. I mean, something interesting to mention is that uh, this mechanism had uh, indeed been invented by Mr. Paul Weber, who licensed it, uh, licensed the manufacturing of this to IWC at the time, and they produced quite an important number of such timepieces. I mean, this licensing uh, practice is not uh, totally unusual in the watchmaking industry, and one uh, of the most famous one concerns the Reverso, which had been invented by French designer René Alfred Chauveau for the sake of Gégère Le Cool, no, for Gégère, I'm sorry, but there had been, uh, for instance, eight models that fully bear the Patek Philippe name. Well, anyhow, so this new Pal Weber is no longer a pocket watch, but comes in an elegant 45 mm wide case, so pretty big, uh, with a nice white lacquer dial, but yeah, it's quite thin at the same time at 12 mm, and comes in three limited uh, case versions, 25 platinum, 250 in red gold, and 500 in steel, but for the occasion, they will also produce like uh, 50 pocket uh, versions of it. So compared to the historical model, this one features a small second indicator at six o'clock, and I have to admit that it's pretty cool to look at and wait for the passage of the minute since uh, you will then witness this instant jump of the buried disc. Actually it makes this little chuck sound uh, on this passage, it's pretty cool. I didn't have the opportunity of wearing uh, on a long period of time and I don't know if this little sound can become annoying but for me it was seriously a nice surprise to see in the flesh. In terms of innovation, uh, just wanted to congratulate Beau and Mercier who introduced a new line called the Clifton Baumatic. And the main reason I say so is that I wasn't too impressed last year with the introduction of their entry-level collection, the Clifton Club. Even if it wasn't too expensive, I really thought they had taken some shortcuts uh, with this one. But now with the Clifton Baumatic, I think they did a pretty good job. The watchers are simple, but rather well balanced. And the main uh, significant features comes with its uh, totally new movement. I mean, it's quite an investment uh, for the brand, with movement uh, which holds five days of uh, power reserve and a magnetic and agmagnetic feature with the use of silicon for its regulating organ. And the price uh, seems quite right, starting at $2,800. Okay, another brand I had uh, shown a bit of discontent last year was Montblanc, and this mainly because I just didn't understand the brand. Too many lines, a much too wide spectrum of products, pricing starting very low to stratospheric heights, but in all honesty, it didn't prevent me of really liking their beautiful bronze case and champagne dial 1858 chronograph tachymeter monopusher uh, watch with its Minerva movement. It was really beautiful. Okay, so the good news for them is that they are seriously reducing their offering, narrowing down the number of collection. And I think that this is a really wise idea for the brand as uh, Davide Cerato, managing director of the watch division of the brand, will quickly explain us. We are very proud of celebrating the 160th anniversary of Minerva. Uh, we took uh, great inspiration from the military watches of the, 30, of the 20s and the 30s uh, to create a very strong new uh, vintage inspired line, the 1858, and we associate this with the concept of a spirit of mountain exploration. This reinforces our sport professional offer after the launch of Time Walker last year. And at the same time, we refresh our iconic classical line, which is Star, with a new uh, strong design and a new label name, which is a Star Legacy. And lastly, also wanted to put forward a new movement that watch presented by H. Moser with the unusual Endeavor Flying Hour with its uh, satellite hour display, a pretty cool watch. And I was happy to see the brand come with something really new uh, in its offering. Legibility is a bit complicated, but in short, you have a central minute disc and three peripheral hour disc and it's the combination of the two that will uh, tell you uh, the time. The brand uh, also introduced a new flying tourbillon movement, quite nice and classy of course. Uh, 
Okay, I could probably go on and on. There was some other interesting things to be seen. Uh, for instance, the evolution of uh, Ulysse Nardin's uh, freak model, uh, and this among others. But uh, I will still uh, stop here concerning specific timepieces and just want to talk about one of the trends seen. And uh, with the fact that many brands propose system that lets you now change straps and bracelets yourself. Something we had seen a couple of years ago with the revamped overseas collection by Vachon Constantin. Uh, this goes in the way of more usability for the owner, but sincerely, this is definitely not the reason why I would buy a Vachon, if you see, why, if you see my thinking. But nevertheless, a pretty good evolution, uh, as long as it's uh, not too much of a gadgety thing. And as one of you pointed out pretty rightly in the comments, it shouldn't be seen as a way to lock you with only straps provided by this brand. And of, of course, I mean this at a premium price. I mean, we don't want uh, brands to replicate the Gillette model where to buy the razor comes cheap, but then you have to pay a lot for the blades. Okay, I say this, but sincerely, I don't know the price of these extra bracelets. Uh, we'll have to do a little bit of homework on this. So overall, brands seem pretty happy about this edition. Uh, business seems to be uh, picking up for more or less everyone. This is of course nice. Basel World will clearly be another important moment to see if we can really call this uh, a trend. And I was also pretty happy to witness that on the last day of the SHH, that's the day when it's open uh, to the public. Uh, okay, entry tickets are pretty expensive, but there were quite a lot of people that came uh, to enjoy all the, these timepieces put on display. But now my biggest highlight by far was to be able to wear this pretty beautiful piece of fashion. I had to go to the SHH a couple of days before it opened and actually everyone had to wear this as security in general got a bit more strict during the event. Apart from this, a few other things evolved for, for this edition. They tried to make it a bit more open. I mean, they tried, for instance, with, the confer with conferences held in a pretty nice auditorium, conferences that were broadcasted live. But when I see the spectacular number of views uh, of a few hundreds uh, generated by this, and when I think of the cost of this infrastructure, because we're talking more or less the latest production means and of course this is something that the brands have to pay for meaning ultimately you the consumer well I'm not too sure it goes in the direction of modesty this industry needs uh, to address but I get that uh, they want to make it more appealing and sexy like me you see simply not sure if they manage to do that but at least they are trying and all in all this is really a wonderful well organized event it was nice that more brands attended probably won't stop there wouldn't be surprised by a few additional brands uh, joining in and i guess there is a bit of pressure on the basel world organi organizers to prevent this happening we'll be there to witness this and i really can't wait to have the opportunity of doing a little share with our coverage uh, which uh, this year will be a little bit different as we will be directly inside the event with our team. And now for some serious business news and I think we'll hear much, uh, much more about this in the months to come because as mentioned in our Who's Who of Watchmaking episode dedicated to the Richmond Group, I had mentioned that the group had a 50% stake in the luxury web portal Netaporte. Well, just a couple of days after the closing of the SHH was announced that Richemont had bought the remaining shares and now control 100% of the luxury e-commerce platform. With a turnover in 2017 of 2.6 billion US dollars, Richmond bought the remaining shares for 3.4 billion and this represents a clear sign when it comes to the commercial strategy of the group. I am seriously not too surprised this was unveiled post SIH as it would have triggered some much more dubious reactions by the many retailers attending the event. Remember that originally this event is primarily organized for them, uh, for them to pass on orders of assortments for their store. But when you look at the big picture on how the business works, well, you have brands, distributors, and ultimately retailers, the last ones facing uh, the end customer, meaning you and me. So we all know that uh, one of the ways for the, these groups to augment their profitability is to internalize the margins made by distributors and retailers and naturally e-commerce of the offers this great opportunity for them. They've already uh, moved on uh, controlling distribution through their own uh, structures, developing more and more modern brand stores controlled directly by them or with partners. But uh, another thing to, uh, to remember is that historically commercial success or brand awareness has often been the result of these retailers doing what it uh, needed to be done on their various mar markets and points of sale.
sale. I mean, again, they were the ones with the contact with the potential end customers. And I'm talking at a point, uh, at a time when marketing didn't really exist as the super effective science we know it today. Success at the time came from the, the terrain and no global marketing campaign uh, really existed. Anyhow, this is probably a worrying sign for some of these retailers as they now face a pretty more powerful direct competitor. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm clearly not saying that this will completely diminish the role of the retailer because watches are not simple commodity uh, that you buy online. I mean, we've been saying it for a long time, but of course it's an emotional product and some watches fit you nicely on the wrist and some others don't. And this, you have to test yourself. So I clearly believe that consumers will make their homework online, pick what they think attracts them, uh, know as much as possible through digital, including us here at the Watches TV. But then I think that most of the actual purchase process will remain at the store. That's where you will deal your watch, give me that 5% discount, something like that. Uh, there's something that will not be possible through a web interface. I mean, just like the radio didn't kill the newspaper, just like the television didn't kill radio and internet the television, well, uh, we're seeing a bit of the same here. The fact that e-commerce will continue to develop even for luxury products, the fact that people will indeed buy more and more through the web is simply a reality and a logical evolution of our consumer habits. But the playground has has indeed changed and everyone has to adapt and of course there is a bit of cynicism behind these announcements made just a few days after the side change. But this is unfortunately just part of a much bigger plan if I can summarize it like this. It's evolution again but will for sure not make the lives of these retailers any simpler. Okay, now I will finally shut up and I guess you see why uh, we had to make two uh, episodes of this prime time. But just wanted to say that uh, with all the nice footage we got during this uh, Geneva Watch Week, we will produce another uh, of our watch porn videos. So no talking, promise. Just a moment of watchmaking bliss and this will come uh, real soon for you guys. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks to our bosses, the patrons. Don't hesitate if you want to share your opinions with us. All the very best to you and see you real soon. Thanks for your time.